This is Jay Krishnamurti's first public discussion in Ojai, California, 1976. We're going to have a dialogue. The word dialogue comes from the word, Greek word logos, which means words by which to express one's deep inner thoughts. Probably most of us don't want to go so deeply as that or expose ourselves too much. But we could have a conversation, not dialectical, which is argumentative, but rather a conversation in which we can share the problems, however deep, and go widely and deeply into them. So this is not, if I may remind you, a converse, a dialogue, a, an argumentative, dialectical conversation. That is, trying to find truth through opinions and arguments. I don't think one can ever come upon that. So we're going to, if we may, this morning, spend an hour or so talking over some issue that is of vital interest. So, please. (laughs) Education, education, and maybe the approach according to different ages. The lady wants to discuss the question of education, according to different ages. In listening to your talk, I'm there what you were saying. Um, there is the reality of war that is created through thought. There is the reality of the tree that is created not through thought. I was struck with the, the idea that there is a mind of the absolute. Some of the traditions, Western and Eastern, say that God thought a tree, and there was a tree, or God said, let there be light, and there was light. And I wonder if we could go into that problem of new thought and what is called the thought of the absolute mind. He wants to go into the question of the absolute reality of truth or God or whatever name one likes to give to it and the thought of everyday life. I'm thinking of, of uh, in the Bible it says it's spoken of the wrath of God, the will of God, and it's, and it's approached almost as if God is thinking. Ah, in the Bible it says the wrath of God and so on, it, it implies God is thinking. I'm sorry God is thinking, isn't it? Too bad. <laughs> we'll come to that. Do you want to discuss, talk over that? I want to discuss the problem of after you awaken the energy in you and your parents curse you and turn you out and you have no friends, what are you to do then? And no place to sleep and nothing to eat. When the energy has been awakened in you and your parents don't like that, they curse you and they throw you out, what do you do then? I can't make up your speaking. I said, <coughs> when this energy has been awakened in you and your parents curse you and you have no more friends and they turn you out and you have no money uh-huh. and you have nowhere to sleep. Uh, when the parents get upset with you and turn you out and you have no place to go 
and no place to sleep. What is one to do? I am saying they didn't do this until I spoke of and told them that a certain energy had awakened in me. Yes, I understand. So what is one to do? Uh, what is our function as a human being? Why, well, why are we here, our function? As a human being, why are we here? Why do I desire a mate? Why aren't I enough? Why do you desire? A mate. Why do I desire? Why do I desire a mate? Why aren't I enough? Oh, why does one desire a mate? Why isn't one self-sufficient? Is that it? Marty say that uh, doing it within society or within the social scene and not uh, leaving it, leave, escaping from the society physically and going to a monastery or... Why do you say one shouldn't escape from the world in which one lives actually and not escape into some monastic world? I think that's enough. May we... First of all, you want to know what kind of education one should have in a school. Not only in one school, college and university, but throughout life, at whatever level one is at. And also you want to know, to talk over, if there is a will of God, if there is the word of God, the wrath of God. So apparently God is thinking. Then there is the question of when a person asserts himself with the parents or says something which he wishes, the parents turn him out, have no money, no place to sleep, what is one to do? And your question, why should one not live alone, be self-sufficient? Why does one desire a mate? Right? Now, which of these questions do you think we should take, including yourself? No, please. I think they may be all related. How do we find a way to live? How do we find a way to live? I think if we could take one question, one issue, and it may be that they are all related to each other. I think they are, because they are all human problems. Being turned out of one's house without money and food and shelter, and what kind of education one should have right through life. That means what kind, what is learning? And also, there is a God who thinks. And is it possible to be completely self sufficient? Okay. I think they are all related, don't you? Or not? So can we take one thing, which is learning? I think as we go along, we'll relate all these to that question, may we? What do you think is learning? Learning, that is, you know the word, what the meaning of that word is. So what is learning? 
why have human beings to learn and what what to learn what is what is the f- function of learning why has education whatever that may mean for the moment has become so important in the world whether you go to india Middle East or Japan or Russia or here, they're they're all being educated. Going through the mill of education, school, college if they are <coughs> if they are lucky, and university, and then getting a job, getting married, settled down, and having all the responsibility. Of a citizen, honourable citizen or dishonourable citizen. So, what is? Why are we being educated? No, please. Why are you educated? If you are lucky enough to go to college and university, why? He said, accumulating information. For what? You please go into it, not just why should I accumulate information to do what to do with it? I would like to learn how to be free of prejudice. Oh, sir? I would like to learn to be free of prejudice so that learning We'll come to all that. But first I want to mustn't we find out why we are being educated dozens and dozens and thousands of schools survive go into it so don't just make a one word go and examine it explore it we are educated at the most expensive schools or the ordinary schools why is it to conform to the pattern of a particular of society please listen find out and turn and become technicians in order to use what we know skillfully right and earn a livelihood that's one part of survival in a particular given society or culture and that's part of that education which is in a world that is becoming more and more overpopulated there must be more and more skilled people to do all kinds of things and one is being educated to conform to that pattern that's one side of it and also in learning what is taking place to the mind in learning acquiring technique uh, information learning a technique as a lawyer businessman as a politician as a any learning a technique what is happening to the whole structure of the of the brain of the mind Hmm? it seems that it becomes fixed come huh? it becomes fixed or frozen mustn't you have that yes technically technically you must have it hmm? so what what is the function of learning you follow i'm questioning i'm a student been to college and university and have acquired certain information knowledge stored up in memory and i use that memory skillfully in any job i have to do i specialize in whatever job as a foreman a laborer whatever it is as a lawyer politician a med doctor and so on an aspect of the physiology is sharp 
function. Yes. What takes place? Is that all? Is that all my life? Is that all one's life? Hmm? Are we educated in any other direction? You follow my question? We spend 20 or 30 years in acquiring a particular technological activity, learn about all about it, and disregard or neglect the, the totality of life. Right? Now we say, is that learning? When you emphasize one part of the life, one segment of life, and learn all about it, how to earn bread and butter, I've put it very simply, the other part totally disregard. That's what's happening. They, they don't disregard it, but train train you in certain beliefs and dogmas and you I'm a Catholic, I'm a Protestant, <laughs> all the rest of it. So is this education? No, don't say no. <laughs> this is actually what is happening. If you had a son, if one had a son, what is one to do in a world of this kind? You don't face the problems. You have children. If you educate them in only one area, small area of life, and disregard the rest of it, you must have a neurotic behavior. Right? A life that is broken up, fragmented. No? So then what is learning and what is education when we think our children should be educated totally, all round? You've, you've understood my question? I want him to understand not only a technological things that he must know, but also I want him to know beauty. Hmm? I want him to know what is relationship with nature, what is relationship with the human being, what is death, what is love. You follow? I want him to know the whole area of life. And no school does teach us that. And therefore, our problem becomes more and more complex. Because we don't know how to live, but we only know the technological field. You... So what shall we do? So we have produced our parents, grandparents, you and we have produced a society a culture that says, learn that part, that segment of life, disregard the rest. What shall we do? Can you educate somebody in that other aspect? Can a person, a human being, be educated in any other aspect besides technology? Is, is it, can there be education in the other aspects? Besides can there be education in the other areas of life. What do you mean by education? To be told, to be given information about the other areas of life? The psychologists are doing it, the anthropologists are doing it, hmm? the philo so-called philosophers are doing it. Is that what we call learning? Isn't the function of education to teach you how to learn and then apply? Uh, who said that, sir? Learn? No, to teach you how to learn, not to teach you facts. But should not education 
teach you how to acquire the how to learn how to learn so that's what we are asking how to learn what does it mean learning i know we have to have a technical facts about learning i know i must learn how to drive a car from another how to do things so on but can i know about myself the vast area from another please this very important question can i learn please just <coughs> about not the technological area but the other areas of life from another from the guru from the psychologists from the anthropologists from all the freuds and you know can i learn from another artist she said perhaps the artist can help in that direction perhaps the artist that means can anybody help me to learn about myself come down to the brass tacks go on i must i must first see that my all of my education has been one of an accumulation of knowledge which has been passed down to me yes sir so we, if, we, if my education has been that then i should have learned about myself already and i have it from another i am asking you much more serious questions so if you don't mind do listen i can learn medicine doctor surgery how to drive a car and so on the technology of all that from another right can i learn about myself from freud from psychologists from gurus from philosophers you learn about them not about yourself no, you're not please just find out if i learn from another from a psychologist hmm, right am i learning about myself or his interpretation about myself hmm? the you understand he maybe points the direction so that you can look at yourself and, and no do try sir i tell you to look at i look at yourself in this way in a particular way hmm? and you try to follow my instructions about yourself hmm does it mean that you have learned about yourself of oh, this is such a simple word or must i learn how to look not from anala but learn what it means to look i don't first of all so look i when i am a human being one is a human being totally related to the rest of other human beings in the world that's an fact hmm? i am not an isolated entity i am related to the rest of the world and i can learn about myself by reading the book which is me because i am the world if i can read that book i don't have to go to anybody right so how am i to learn to look at myself which is the vast area which traditional education doesn't explore traditional education doesn't help me i wonder if you're getting all this 
Are you following all this? Just uh, Mustn't one have the desire to learn? Do you have the desire to learn about yourself now, here? Would you be a little bit honest, if I may say so, and say, have you the desire, as the lady points out, to learn about yourself? Not according to Freud, Jung, uh, latest psychologists, and so Learn to learn about yourself, because you are the world, and the world is you. You are a human being, totally related to all the rest of other human beings in the world, whether you like it or not. If you have a desire to learn, or the necessity, or the urgency, and you see the importance of learning about yourself, because if you don't know about yourself, what can you know about life? We're going to find out. We're going to find out how to look at ourselves, learn about <laughs> My questions are, as the lady put it, do we have the desire or the urgency or the necessity, see the importance that we must learn about ourselves? Do we have that urgency? Or you just well, tell me all about it and I'll, I'll, I'll take what parts I like and I'll dis- neglect I, what I don't like. I don't know. I'm asking a very simple question. When we're confused, we realize we have that problem. But all huh? times we, we forget it. When we're confused, when we make mistakes, we realize we don't know what's going on, and then we have seriousness concerning it. But most of the time, we forget about it. Look, I want to know about myself. Mm-hmm. How am I to learn about myself? So I must find out what it means to learn, right? And what it means to observe. There are two things involved in it. What it means to learn and what it means to observe. i put it the other way around. What it means to observe and what it means through observation, learning. May we go on from there? What does it mean to observe oneself? You understand? This vast area which has been neglected, which we have taken for granted, which is crowded with a lot of beliefs, prejudices, dogmas, and so on, I want to learn all about that. So I say, what? To, before I learn, I must look, right? Now, how am I to look? What does it mean to look? The art of looking. You understand? The word art means to put everything in the right place, where it belongs. That's the meaning of that word art. The artist is one, please listen, not to just paint pictures or write a poem. An artist is one who puts everything in its right place. So you're giving a new meaning to art, to an artist. You follow? So. The art of learning, art of observation, what does it mean? How do I observe? Not only myself, the world around me. 
the politicians, the businessmen, the priests, the wife, the husband, the educator. Well, how do I observe it? One must be receptive to what is actually there. How, no, you're, how, how do you observe things, sir? How do you look at that mountain? You put your, you your eyes, you see outside. But if you look with your mind, you look in with your eyes. We'll come to that. First, when you, what is, how do you look at those mountains? Open your eyes. <laughs> <laughs> of course, sir. You are lo- you are sitting there with your eyes open, and you see those mountains, like those range of mountains. How do you, what is your reaction when you look at them? Silence. <laughs> most of the time you are not interested at all. Huh? I would say most of the time you are not interested. You are not interested most of the time. You, I'm, so you are now, you are looking, <laughs> you are looking at those mountains. What is your reaction? You're paying attention. Out of that attention, what's your reaction when you look at those? Goodness. I don't think we ever have a reaction, or at least very rarely. <coughs> We're not even looking, I don't think. That is it. Have you time to look at it? Do you, sitting there, say, wait, I'm going to look at those mountains and find out what my reactions are, what I feel. And use words by which you express that which you feel, which is a dialogue. What takes place when you look at those mountains? There is visual sensation, there is visual perception, there is sensation, isn't there? Then what takes place? The mind latches on. Do look, sir, don't. You name that sensation as a result. You name it. Hmm? You name it. You say that's a mountain. Hmm? Right? A reaction with things past. Huh? A reaction with things past inside of you. Yes, sir, I know. Go. Then you stop looking, generally. We identify. Notice details. Look, sir, may I go into it? <laughs> You're all. You look at that mountain, you see it. There are the, re- the reaction of beauty, the shadow, the depth, the line of it, the valleys, and you say that's a mountain. You verbalize it. Hmm? Then it's beautiful, right? So you, when you are verbalizing it, you have gone away from looking, right? Oh, do please. To experience it. Huh? To experience it. Experience. Experiencing what? Mountain. You're experiencing the mountain? Your reaction to the mountain. I give up. You just observe, don't you? In that observation, when there is verbalization, hmm, you are already moved away from observation, haven't you? Of this so simple, isn't it? Yeah. 
So can you observe without verbalizing? Just to observe without naming. Now, can you look at yourself, observe yourself, without saying good, bad, get depressed? You follow? Just to observe. Don't make it hard or easy. Just do it. Please, this is not group therapy. <laughs> uh, the horror of group therapy. It is silly. So please, this is not group therapy. What we are trying to find out is the art of learning. the art of observing. Can I observe the tree, the things about me, around me, the act of politicians, what is going on in the world, observe there, and ob- observe myself. See actually what I am without any interpretation, without judgment, just to look at myself, which is the art means, as we explained, to put where everything belongs, in its right place. So I look at myself, myself, which is the complex structure of my human activity, you follow? My ambitions, my greed, my envy, my deceits, my arrogance, my my double talk, everything I look. My tradition would say, there is God, and my tradition also says, there is no God. One part of me says, the whole uh, rituals of churches and all the rest of it is nonsense. Other parts frightened if I say that out. I might lose my job or I might get into difficulty. One part of me says, I must take drugs, because everybody is doing, they say, you get experience, most extraordinary things, and the other part says, don't be silly. And so on and on and on and on. Can I look at all these various complex, complex activities in myself? Probably one never has done it. Right? So what am I to? What, what, what is there to learn? You are falling. You're you're going to sleep, are you? Is this all too too much in the mo- of a morning and a lovely morning? What does one know? How does one know which is the right place? That's a good question, isn't it? How is one to know to put things in their right place? How do you... How, hmm? He has asked me that question. I'll show you. I don't know. <laughs> Wait, don't, don't, please, just find your people. Don't. He asked me a question How do you put everything where it belongs? Correct, accurate place. He asked me that. And I say, 
I don't know. Please listen. I don't know, but I'm going to find out. You understand? I don't say, this is the right place, that's the wrong place. So my mind is free to find out. So I don't accept tradition, which is the right place. I don't follow the authority which tells me which is the right place. You follow? So I say, I don't know. So I begin to observe. I see there is a contradiction in oneself, right? Now, why is there a contradiction in oneself? As long as there is a contradiction, I can't, there, you cannot find the right place, can you? You please see a very simple fact like that. I don't know. But I do know that I'm in conflict. Right? So I say, as long as I'm in conflict, I will not, I I will never know what is the right place. Right? So I must find out why I'm in conflict. What is conflict? And if if the mind can ever be free from conflict, then I will put everything in the right place. You've understood? Because I said I don't know, which is a fact, but I do know I'm in conflict. And as long as I'm in conflict, there's no right place. Right? Right, sir? So, what is conflict? Because that becomes much more important what is the right place. What is, why is a human being in conflict? Because he, he is divided in himself, contradictory. Hmm? Right? Now, why is there contradiction? Are you, are you inquiring with me? Or you just listen. Why is there conflict? What? You're in conflict when you don't trust your feelings. <laughs> your feelings also may be contradictory. I want one thing and I don't want another thing. My feeling says, oh, eat more, and my mind says, don't eat more. <laughs> So feelings can't be trusted. <laughs> you haven't you haven't understood what I said. Intuition. That's one of the most dangerous things, isn't it? I'm in conflict when I'm dividing what what is from what should be. That's right. So but we are educated, trained to what should be. So there's a contradiction. So as long as there is a contradiction, I will not know what's the right thing to do. So I am in contradiction. Therefore, one is in a contradiction. What is that? What is contradiction? Is it two opposing desires? Or opposing objects of desire? Or being uncertain, I say one thing and do another. You are following all this? So, I say to myself, why does, why does one live in contradiction? Why doesn't one live with what is, not with what should be? 
you, which is a contradiction, right? Why can't I live with actually what is? We, we do look at it. One is envious. Hmm? Live with it. Not have the opposite. I mustn't be envious. It's um, immoral to be envious, or it's rationalized to be. Follow. Live with it. We don't live with it because we don't know what to do with it. You understand? If you knew what to do with it, then the opposite would exist. A capito? I mean, have you understood? Then if you, if you have a habit, you can't learn about it if you're trying to change it, yes? Yes. Look at it. If I, I have a habit, say for scratching myself or twisting my finger, something or other, look at it. Be aware of it. With all your senses, don't say, I must not do that. That means a conflict, that's a, a duality, that means conflict. So, wait a minute. So, we come to it. Slowly we are learning that is coming, which is, as, I, as we do not know how to live with envy, hmm, what to do with it, we think we shall get rid of it or do something about it if we move away from it. Which is not to be envious. The ideal of a human being who is not envy, who doesn't have any envy. That must be a marvelous state. Hmm? So you move away from what is, from the fact of envy. Right? When you move away from the fact of envy, what takes place? When you don't move away, what takes place? What do look at it, do look at it. Remember yesterday we were talking about the scientists are saying some of them at least have been told that when you look at a cell at a cell through a microscope as you are observing it is undergoing a transformation mm-hmm. now we are saying as you observe envy without its opposite you understand Without trying to avoid it, ration, just to look at it, the very process of observation is transforming the envy, totally. I, listen to it carefully, you will get it in a minute. That is, we will keep to envy. We are used, when we have that feeling of envy, we either rationalize it, justify it, or condemn it. Right? Which is a division, isn't it? In that there is a conflict. The observer says, I must not be envious. The observer says, Why shouldn't I be envious? In a world that is full of envy, if I don't be, if I am not envious, I will be destroyed. Or avoids it. So the observer says, I must do something about it. So there is a division between the observer and the fact of envy. When you look at the microscope without the observer, (laughs) you understand? Then that which is envious undergoes radical change. And I'll show you why. Don't accept what I am saying. I'm not your authority, I'm not your guru, for God's sake. Mm -hmm. It undergoes a change because justification, condemnation, or rationalization 
is a wastage of energy. Right? And when you have com- that, when you don't waste that energy through that, you have that energy. That energy transforms the fact of envy. Have you- Look, I have a habit, twisting my fingers. Mm-hmm. You know, most people have this. They can't keep still. They are doing something or other. Look at it. Don't rationalise it. Don't say, well, other people do it. Why shouldn't I do it? Just watch it. Mm-hmm. Which means you are not wasting your energy by saying, other people do it, why shouldn't I do it? I've been used to that, why should let it go? But when you don't waste all that energy hmm, in rationalization, justification and so on, you have all that energy, right? Then observe that, with that energy, the twisting of fingers. I wonder if you get it. If you don't, it's up to you. Um, let's get on with it. I can't hear you, sir. Would you mind saying a little louder? The energy of, of habit is one thing, and the energy of observation is another. The, the two energies are not different, are they? He says there's the energy that's caught up in the habit, the and the energy that observes. He says, uh, are they different, or no. are they the same? The same, of course. But it's not just the feeling of it. Wait, let's keep to simple thing. If you have understood this thing, this principle, that when you rationalize, justify, or condemn, you're wasting energy. The energy that is needed to observe what is. Whether, whether it's a, any kind of feeling, any kind of reaction, any kind of prejudice, and so on. But it demands action. If you're envious, it, it, it wants to say harsh words. It wants to. It, wait, I know all that. But don't abstain a little bit. <laughs> oh, well, this is what I mean. Of course, I mean. Uh, how, how does one look at envy? How does one look at envy? Aren't you envious? Aren't you? It will become silent. <laughs> Aren't you envious? Can't, can't you look at it? Know the feeling of it? Envy means comparison, doesn't it? I compare myself with you, who are more intelligent, more bright, more clever, and all the rest of it, taller, beautiful, and all that. I compare myself with you. So, where there is comparison, there must be envy. In that envy there is imitation, the desire to conform to the pattern. Right? All that is implied in being envious. Hmm? Now, you mean to say you can't look at it? Can't you look at the feeling of envy as it arises? Of course you can. But how do you not judge it? Just look at it. I can't. You see, it's a wrong question to ask. How am I to not to judge it? But you have been used to judging. And therefore you say, how am I not to do it? If I tell you how not to do it, then you, your old tradition and the new tradition will be in battle. I wonder if you see all this. Whereas if you say, look, I'm envious, I'm going to watch it. I'm going to see if I'm comparing myself with anybody. And we are educated to compare ourselves. I am poor, you are rich, both 
physically and psychologically, and I am envious of you, because I want to be rich like you. You mean, so you can't know the, the feelings that arise as they come up? Can't you watch that? But the envy says, I don't want to sit here and be watched, I want to go express myself. Oh, go ahead and do it. Well, it won't sit still for you to watch. Go it. ahead and do it. Be caught by it. That's what we are all doing. She doesn't understand how it's the same energy, the habit and the observation. When I twist my fingers, twiddle my fingers, isn't that energy? Hmm? When I condemn it and say, isn't that part of that same energy? I, no, I, no. I'm afraid you have not understood what I've said. I'm envious. Envy implies comparison, measurement, imitation, conformity. Right? All those are implied in envy. And most human beings are envious, almost everybody. And am I envious? I want to find out. Of course, I, one is. Hmm? Right? Are you following the. Is this clear, madam? Yes. Now, can you watch it? Are you watching it? With, with the feeling of condemnation, with the feeling of uh, 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 judgment, or just watch it. Because condemnation, justification, <laughs> rationalization are a wastage of energy. The energy which is needed to focus all your attention on what is, which is envy. Because when you condemn, justify, rationalize, it is the observer, you understand? The past, who says condemn, the past says judge, the past says it's quite all right. So the past, which is also energy, when you don't waste that energy, you have that energy to observe. Understood now? Is it observing different from the past? Yes, totally different from the past. Observing. Sir, are you saying that one is that energy? The habit, the envy? Course. You mean your consciousness is it, do you not? I mean, it's absurd to say that you are the energy, right? I, I th you haven't understood each other, so don't. Let's find out. Hmm? Aren't you. When you think you are using energy, aren't you? When you feel that's a form of energy, when you get angry, envious, afraid, and so on, that's all en energy, isn't it? Envy, jealousy, anger is you. And so on. Is that whole complex structure is you. Which means you, the past. When, when you look at envy and you see that you are envious, then you also see that you are judging envy. Will that energy of observing the fact that you are judging 
the fact that you are envious, will that energy transform the judgment? I, I, if you are still judging, oh, the love of Peter. Why do we judge? Which means you have a preconceived opinion, right? A prejudice. No? When you look at a picture in a museum, you judge it, judge it don't you? You judge it by saying it is by so and so. Therefore, he's already famous, already known, he must be a very good painter, and therefore I like it or don't like it. You are judging already. That is, you have formed an opinion. Your brain is in operation of forming opinions all the time. It's part of your education, part of your tradition to judge. No? So you are never look. If it is by Picasso, you say, My God, he's such a marvelous painter, already finished. Van Gogh or this or that. So you prevent yourself from looking. Thought creates an image, image being prejudice, right? Image being a conclusion. How can I look without a conclusion, without an opinion, without a judgment? See how how we are trained, educated and conditioned to operate always with judgment, opinions. Hmm? And that you call freedom. So that you can use something, so that I can take that mountain, I have to analyze the color, analyze the size, the distance. But can you just look at it without analyzing? See envy because I can't even see the mountain. That just it, sir. So carry on now. From there, we said learning. I want to. I mean, we have only learned about a very small part of existence, the technological existence, and the rest we do not learn about it. And we say, how am I to learn about? By observing, looking at it, myself, which is the world and the world is me, looking at my at this world which is me, without any judgment. Right? Can you do it? As the gentleman pointed out, the parents turn you out. Because you are, you do something, they are judging you, they are pushing you out of the house, they destroy your affection, the bitterness, if all the rest of it follows. So, there is a vast field, a complex area in the human mind which has not been explored. They have explored it, the psychologists, anthropologists and all others have explored it theoretically, or experimented with animals, gone down to Africa and looked at the gorillas and said, by studying those I will learn about myself. Don't laugh. This is what's happening. 
where there is, you don't have to go to India or to a Zen monastery to learn about yourself. You can learn about yourself where you are, because that is your world. So don't waste money on going to America, to Africa. <laughs> so this is your world in which you live. Your neighbour, your wife, your husband, and so on. The world, the small micro micro world is the large world. If you if one knows how to look at that small little world, so learning implies when you look at yourself, you can learn about yourself only when. The accumulated experience doesn't interfere with the actual observation at the at the moment of what is. Have you understood that? I'm going to listen. <laughs> I look at myself. Myself is constantly moving. It isn't static, right? Have you noticed it? Hmm? One moment is peaceful, the next moment is angry, the next third moment it, it has pursuing some pleasure. It, it's constantly in action, movement. Hmm? And I have learnt by looking at myself something about it, right? That becomes an experience, that becomes the knowledge. With that knowledge, I look next time. See what has happened. I look at the present movement with a past knowledge. Therefore, I never look. You have understood this? So, can I look at the present movement without? the past experience impinging upon it. I wonder if you follow all this. I feel that um, I, I ask myself the question, can I look without the past knowledge, but I am the past knowledge. Yes, so can you look at yourself without the observer who is the past? Huh? Then you have to be in the present. Now, what does that mean? You have to be in the present. What do you really see when you look at yourself that way? Do you know, sir, just listen to that question. He says, I have to be in the present. What does that mean? You have to forget the past. No? What does it mean to be in the present? Don't know. <laughs> huh? Can you observe without the past? It'll be there. It'll do it, sir. Do it. See, find out. I can see the past pop up, but I can see in the present the past is coming forth. No, it's a very simple. Look, I flatter you, or I insult you. That is registered in your memory, right? Right. Now, next time I meet you, can you forget those insult or flattery and look at me? That is the present, isn't it? Sir, you say can you ask the question, can you see the past without uh, can you see the can you see can you watch yourself without the past? Which is the same thing as saying, Can you watch yourself without you? That's right. And I don't understand that. <laughs> <laughs> you are the past, aren't you? 
your accumulated memories, experiences, knowledge, interests, all in the past. Knowledge is the past. Knowledge is the past, right? So look, I read the Bible and it says, or some book says, God is will. Hmm? I like that idea. Hmm? I think it's marvellous. And that becomes a prejudice, doesn't it? Whether it's a reality, whether it is, has any truth in it, I don't. I, it doesn't matter. I, it appeals to me that God is looking after me, right? So I, I get a fixed idea. I am that fixed idea, and I live with that idea for many years. And you come around and say, don't be silly, that's a prejudice. And I and you say, I can't get rid of it. Right? It's so part of me. Of course it's part of you. Don't, he says, don't get rid of it, but look at it. You observe it. Don't fight it. Observation, sheer observation, with no uh, past affecting the state of observation. What happens to the observer and the object observed? That's just what I was saying, sir. What happens when the past doesn't interfere with the thing observed? Right, sir? What happens? To the thing observed, and what happens to the observer? Wait, wait, are you answering him? You asked me a question, I said there's only observed. You don't exist anymore. You see? (laughs) See, this is all guesswork. He asked a question, which is, what happens to the the thing observed and to the observer when the past is not? Right, sir, that was the question. What is the observer? Is he not the past? What is his experience, his prejudice, his knowledge? The observer, in essence, is the past. There is only observation. Then that which is observed undergoes radical transformation. I wish you would do it and find out. Is anybody doing it besides yourself? <laughs> yes. Now look, I want, there's something I want to find out, which is, I want to find out if there is a way of living without conflict. Right through my life, not just for a few minutes. Right? Because if there is conflict, there is violence. There's all kinds of things come out of that conflict. Violence, bitterness, anger, hatred, throwing bombs, terrorism, Brutality comes out of that conflict. No civilization, no culture can exist in conflict as the modern world is living culture. It is destroying itself. 
So, as a human being, related to the world, I say, is it possible to live without a single conflict? Have you ever asked that question? Hmm? Have you really? Not only between you and me, my wife and without a shadow of conflict in oneself. I want then have uh, after having the asked that question, I'm going to it. Because it's very important for a human being to find out. Otherwise it's going to destroy hum- human humanity. You understand? I don't think you see the importance of this. See, the conflict between the Arab and the Jew is going to destroy them, isn't it? No? Between the Muslim and the Hindu, that's going to destroy it. Communists and the the capitalists, they are going to destroy each other. The Catholic, the Protestant, you follow? And conflict in oneself. One, as a human being, living in this chaos, in this conflicting, mad, insane world, you must find out. So, can, I, can a human being live in this modern culture, which is no culture, in this modern culture, without a single conflict in himself. He can. If, you're, if one goes into it very seriously, you find out that if conflict exists as long as there is fragmentation in oneself. Right? And this fragment is between the observer, as the observer and the observed. You see it? As long as there is a division between the observer and the observed, there must be conflict. I am a Jew, you are an Arab. Or I want opposing, contradictory desires. You follow all this? Huh? <laughs> if we destroy each other, there will be no problem. Is that what you're saying? We are distro- <coughs> Quelle histoire! Hmm? If the truth of our divine wholeness is covered over by these illusions of self and other things, these fragments. How do you know you are covered over by divine intelligence? I, don't, I didn't say I was covered over by divine intelligence. I said, if my divine wholeness. How do you know your divine whole? I am not the divine whole. I have experienced my being a uh, by my uh, that there is a a, a wholeness. The, the truth of that wholeness is covered over by these fragments that we examined yesterday uh, this weekend. Of uh, these fragments of, of parts of, of self and other things. And you were saying that. Uh, and some of these things, these divisions or fragments are are the uh, the, the division. Sure. It's not the un, uh, the discovery of the wholeness. Uh, a process of infinite perfectibility, rather than uh, do we arrive uh, at a at a perfection, but isn't it an infinite perfectibility? So just take. What is? Don't let's imagine that we are perfect. Just take actually what's going on 
outside of us and inside, actually. But a life without conflict, without sorrow, without pain, isn't that a statement of perfection? I, it is not a statement of perfection. Human beings suffer. One asks, is there an end to sorrow? Which doesn't mean one wants to live a perfect life. I don't know what perfect life is. We are moving away from something. This I've asked: Is there a way of living in this culture, in this world, in your daily life, in which there is no conflict? Have we said as long as there is a division? Hmm? Outwardly, uh, the Arab Jew and uh, the Muslim, the Hindu, communist, and so on, so on. As long as there is outward division, there must be conflict. And as long as there is inward division, there must be conflict. Right? The outward division, we have created it. Right? I am a Jew or an Arab, and I won't give up my prejudice, my culture, my etc. I stick to my prejudice. I said, no, you follow? So inwardly, I've got, there is division, as the observer and the observed. But the observer is the observed. If you see that, once the truth of it, then all conflict ends. Then you won't be fighting that which is observed. Does the division remain? Huh? You say you've eliminated the conflict. The conflict was caused by division. After you've eliminated the conflict, does the division remain? No, of course not. How can it and remain? With no division, there's wholeness. And you don't, don't go beyond. That's just an idea. Find out what it means to live wholly. The word whole. Whole means healthy, physically, sane, you know, sanity, to think clearly, objectively, rationally, and holy, H O L Y, sacred. The word whole means all that. I didn't, sir. You were, I made it fairly clear. You can't be holy all the time, you have to eat. <laughs> what time is it? 12.30. <laughs> we'll meet again on Thursday.